and they were afraid. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Before I preach to you, I want to tell you that as I heard the chain ringing bells this morning, and as I remember the night of the fire, I burst into tears. And it may happen again, so be warned. All right. They were afraid to help us probe the depth of Easter terror. I want one more reading. I want to read to you from the Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to Flannery (laughs) O'Connor. And I'm going to, to focus on an amazing part of a story she told with the title Revelation, but I gotta set the context. And I've been at Grace Church Alexandria all last night for the Easter Vigil. Well, that's what it felt like. I've been telling Easter stories all night long, and I'm going to be telling some more this morning. So I want to tell you about the story that Flannery O'Connor wrote called uh, Revelation. It's an amazing story. It is a story in three scenes. Scene number one takes place in a doctor's office somewhere in Georgia, and I'm going to say the year is 1960. Ruby Turpin is in the doctor's office with Claude. He has an ulcer on his leg, needs to be seen. So she's sitting in the waiting room. And Ruby Turpin is a wonderful Christian in the very worst sense of the word. (laughs) And she's sitting in that doctor's waiting room and and Flannery O'Connor lets us both into her conscience and into some dialogue she's having. She's sitting there and the first thing she noticed is that white trash woman sitting across from her, and that white trash woman has the snuff stains on her lips. And Ruby just finds that woman and her snuff stained lips pretty disgusting. But then there's a lady that's very well dressed sitting next to her, and she and, and Ruby strike up a conversation, and it's, it's just an amazing conversation. Ruby is so clear about everything. She's so absolutely clear about the racism that she owns and believes. She's clear about the world and how it's structured. She's real clear that Jesus has just put her at the very top of what she considers to be the hierarchy of society. At the bottom of that hierarchy are shiftless black people who are lying in the streets demanding their rights for some reason. And then there are white trash, they're, they're the bottom, and she's real proud that Jesus didn't make her either. She just loves Jesus for that. <laughs> and then, moving up in the hierarchy are, are white people that work for a living and rent. They're renters. Renters are good people. But they're not as good as people who own their own houses, and you know, Jesus has blessed her with her own house. <laughs> And finally, at the very top, the upper echelon, are those people that Jesus has not only given a house to, but given some land. And in this waiting room, Ruby just talked to this other woman about, you know, how she's... Ruby said, you know, I'm really... I try to be such a good Christian. You know, it's so hard to get those black people to pick cotton. They're so spoiled, but I try to love them anyway because, you know, I am a Christian. And she said, you know, what I do every day, she's talking to this lady next to her, what I do every day is I I get them a nice big bucket of water and I put a whole tray of ice cubes in it because I want them to keep coming and working hard. So I want them to know they're appreciated. It just gets worse. It gets worse and worse and worse. And in the rating room is this young woman who's described as an intense pimply faced bookish girl that's absorbed in a book but every time Ruby opens her mouth this woman is getting increasingly horrified and disgusted by Ruby Turpin's worldview and Franny kind of lets us into one insight (laughs) this young southern Georgia girl has been studying at Wellesley And all of a sudden, this young woman 
cannot stand another second of it. She slams her book shut, picks it up, hurls it across the room and hits Ruby right upside the head, knocking Ruby to the floor. Well, the nurse comes in, forces the girl that has just hurled the book to the floor, forces her to have a sedative. Ruby's on the floor right next to her. Claude's on the floor trying to comfort Ruby. Flannery O'Connor can write a scene. And as the young Wellesley student is drifting into her imposed unconsciousness, Ruby says to her as they're both lying side by side on the floor, Ruby says, was there something you wanted to say to me? <laughs> and before she drifts, drifts off with the effect of the sedative, the... <laughs> The young woman looks Ruby in the eye and says, Go straight back to hell, you warthog, where you came from. <laughs> Scene two. <laughs> Ruby and Claude have made it home from that momentous morning in the doctor's office, and they're having a bit of a lie down after some sweet tea. But Ruby can't sleep. Now, Claude goes right to sleep. He's over it. But Ruby, Ruby's staying awake, and she can't take this nap, and she's tossing and turning, and she's trying to make terms of what that girl said to her. She's horrified by it. And, and she and Jesus review all the reasons why it was unfair. And then she elbows old Claude and said, Claude, it's time for you to get up and and take the cotton pickers home. You all, you take them on home. And she gets up and she goes to the kitchen and she gets the bucket of water and she puts a whole tray of ice and it, you know, she's a Christian woman. And she hands it to the folks that have been picking cotton all day, one bucket, cause you know, they don't mind drinking from the same bucket. Cotton pickers don't mind that at all. And she said, you take them on home. I'll go, I'll go, I'll go take care of the hogs. And so she's hosing down the hogs because it's been kind of a hot day. And here I know, I just know intuitively that Flannery O'Connor has read the parable of the prodigal son because it all is going to happen in the pig pen. And Ruby, warthog Ruby, is drawn to the pig. She is one after all. And she's drawn to the pigs and she's hosing them off. And then it happens. And these are Flannery's words. Until then, the sun slipped finally behind the tree line. Miss Turpin remained there with her gaze bent to them as if she were absorbing some abysmal life-given knowledge. At last, she lifted her head. There was only a purple streak in the sky cutting through a field of crimson and leading like an extension of the highway into the descending dusk. She raised her hands and from the side of the pen in a gesture hieric and profound, a visionary light settled in her eyes. She saw the streak as a vast swinging bridge extending upward from the earth through a field of living fire. Upon it, a vast horde of souls were rumbling toward heaven. There were whole companies of white trash clean for the first time in their lives and bands of black folks in white robes and battalions of freaks and lunatics shouting and clapping and leaping like frogs. And bringing up the rear end of the procession was a tribe of people she recognized as ones as those who, like herself and Claude, had always had a little of everything and the God-given wit to use it right. She leaned forward to observe them closer. They were marching behind the others with great dignity, accountable as they had always been for good order and common sense and respectable behavior. They alone were on key. Yet, 
she could see by their shocked and altered faces that even their virtues were being burned away. She lowered her hands and gripped the rail of the hog pen, her eyes small but fixed unblinkingly on what lay ahead. In a moment, the vision faded, but she remained where she was, immobile. At length, she got down and turned off the faucet and made her slow way on the darkening path to the house. In the woods around her, the invisible cricket choruses had struck up, but what she heard were the voices of souls climbing upward into the starry field and shouting hallelujah. And they were afraid. And Ruby was afraid. Afraid that the accusation hurled at her with the book was true. To face that truth, she had to visit hell. She had to be with the swine. Because after all, she was pretty piggish. The Holy Catholic Church holds as an essential truth that the first location for the Easter rendezvous is hell. He descended into hell. We're going to say it again in the creed. The first place for the Easter rendezvous is hell, not Galilee. That's where Jesus met Ruby. That's where Jesus meets us. We meet Jesus first in the place of our deepest fears, in the place of isolation, in the place of purgation, where all the false virtues and all the false props of our ego must surrender. All of those false props must surrender to the only reality of the universe, which is that God raised Jesus from death and that this living God can find us in our fears, can find us in our failures, can find us in our death and our despair and our isolation. Last Christmas, we learned that the Word became flesh in Jesus Christ. But today, I think we must learn also that flesh becomes Word in Jesus. Flesh became Word in Jesus as he drank from the Samaritan woman's cup. Flesh became word in Jesus as he dined with tax collectors, as he wrote on the ground while others caressed their stones that they wanted to hurl at the woman who was the sacrament and sign of their own adulteries. Easter raises all of Jesus' words to the status of blood-red rubrics. I was hungry. I was thirsty. I was in prison. Every bag of groceries delivered to a hungry person is a rubric of resurrection presented in the now capital N of resurrection life. I am afraid. Because his words, his blood-red rubric stamped with Easter authority, annihilate my ego and my satisfying virtues. 
I free fall towards hell and terror. And then and only then am I caught and grasped and captured by a love that is stronger than death. Buried with Christ by baptism into his death, we take our first steps away from the pool and we join that hallelujah singing band of lunatics as they march towards glory because baptism creates solidarities not of our choosing but of God's choosing. They march towards glory. And they continue in that march. And they persevere in that march. And in that march they proclaim. And in that march they seek and they serve and they strive. Because fear has surrendered to a word of love that is stronger than death. With the courtesy of our terror... mingled with costly hope and hell by love, I think we must tremble before we shout hallelujah. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. With the courtesy of terror mingled with costly hope and hell by love stronger than death, an Easter power Jesus borrows our flesh and our lives and we become gospel word to a deaf and frightened world in our time, in our now, in this eternal Easter. Hallelujah, Christ is risen.